Very pleased to introduce Zach Pinson. We will talk on the winter uniform, George the Third, jeans and t-shirts. Thank you, Zach. I'm on a little stage, this is quite exciting. Hello everyone, um, and welcome to my talk. Uh, the winds uniform, George the Third's jeans and t-shirt. So, the winds uniform is a particularly interesting thing. It's a uniform, but not a uniform. So firstly, what is it? Ooh, does this work it? Oh yes. Ah, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> It's the white heat technology. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right. So, what is it? This took me researching around all I could find originally was pictorial evidence, which, as we all know from potentially researching things, especially when it comes to military uniforms or something like that, there are things written down about what it is. So, found an original tailor's manual. Um, which detailing all different British regiments and things um, in the um, Bucks and Hawkmaster uh, combinations, which, which are a wonderful collection of books and have all these wonderful details in. So, wins uniform. Blue coat, single-breasted, scarlet cuffs um, and collar. Um, now, buttons by two-inch motifs positions, and then sleeve, French riding sleeve, um, and then to the buttons count faced with the same sleeve, lined with um, then casimir and then casimir waistcoat, and finished straight breeches, and then it talks about the breeches, uniform breeches and whatnot. So we've then got an idea of, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Which isn't really very helpful. Um, so it's got some things of, okay, a blue coat with scarlet cuffs and collar, single-breasted, um, buttons in sets of twos, um, and a French riding sleeve. Interestingly, term French riding sleeve doesn't really come up anywhere else. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, what's that? So that took me down the rabbit hole of what could this be? What was the shaping like? Now, there are various... Um, orders in this set of things of orders for the Winds uniform over about 30 years and it changes each and every time but I've gone to the, the Royal Archives and Windsor and whatnot and it's not actually properly written down specifically what the Winds uniform is because it's sort of constantly evolving and interestingly it can only be gifted at the discretion of the monarch even today Hmm. Which is why, when you look at historical adaptations with King George III, Madness of King George, for example, he's wearing a uniform that's close and similar, but there's like red lapels going on, or there's like epaulettes happening. So in film and TV, you won't find an exact replica of the Winds uniform because they still need the monarch's permission. So I had to ask permission <laughs> for this. So through Hand and Lock, um, who, who supplied the braid um, and, and helped me with bits of the research, um, through them I got permission to recreate the Winds uniform. And interestingly, every wearer of the Winds uniform was also um, a member of the most notable order of the Garter. Now, Hand and Lock, they obviously hold the Royal Warrant. Um, for creating all the embroidery and everything for the Winds uniform. Uh, well, for the military and everything, full stop. And the Windsor uniform now is basically just a dark navy blazer with red collars and cuffs, which is fine. These things, are, the, these things develop. Um, <laughs> 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 these things change. Um, so... And they said, oh, and um, would you be able to make the garter? It's like, well, actually, we can't actually make you the garter star, because if we make you the garter star, it actually counts as giving you the order of the garter. And I'm like, I'm not asking for that. Um, anyway, they then talk to their people and whatnot, and it gets pushed up probably quite high up the, up the chain. And they say, oh, yeah, we'll just make you a copy. It's fine. 
you're wearing the garter. And then they also made the garter as well. <laughs> so, so I've got the star and the thing, so it's all quite fun. Um, I, and highly illegal. <laughs> and, yes, without permission, it's highly illegal. <laughs> Off to the tower. Well, exactly, so, so this is quite fun. So it gets me down to the idea of shaping and what does this then look like? Which took me to, let's look at uniforms around this period as well, the Napoleonic period. Now, this uniform that I'm wearing online and everything gets mistaken for, oh, it's a, you know, naval uniform. No. Um, but you can see where they get that from. Mm. And then again, this, is, this uniform here is the uniform uh, of the Royal Artillery Horse Guards. And this is also described in the Buckmaster book as being a single-breasted dark coat <laughs> with um, scarlet collar, cuffs and lapels but it still calls it a single-breasted. So single-breasted can be like that, or like this sort of thing, mm. or then potentially like that, because they're all called different things. But this one, interestingly, I mean, you, you can't really see it on the definition here, but there is a buttoning sleeve here, but no detail about how the sleeve is done. So it's interesting that specifically, the Wind's uniform was referred to as having a French riding sleeve. So I was like, what the fuck's that? <laughs> so, what I had to do is I then had to go through all these 1790s portraits and things of people wearing the Winds uniform, uh, or people just wearing French dress and seeing what could the sleeve be like. But we'll come back to that, because after all, why is it so associated with King George III? And why am I calling it his jeans and t-shirt? because he is depicted in it in so many things. Um, so interestingly, um, this lovely portrait, um, which is wonderful because it has a little dog, um, <laughs> was, um, was in the recent exhibition at the uh, Queen's Gallery in Buckingham Palace, mm -hmm. and they showed King, King George III in his Windsor uniform at Windsor. Um, and there's another one, and the one you saw beforehand, and there's caricatures and things. This was his easy uniform. Now, he institutes the uniform in 1777. For no reason at all. Nothing to do with um, losing the colonies. Um, <laughs> where all of a sudden you've got this notion of, ah, oh, monarchies across Europe are falling apart and fracturing and I can't really be walking around like a French <laughs> king because they're clearly not doing very well. So it was that notion of where do they go from there? Instead of wearing the luscious silks and everything, you think we need to do a military stance. But if I start wearing loads of military uniforms, because, I'm, he, because they've also still got their ties to Germany um, and Hanover, it's then which, which regiment do you pick, which uniform do you pick, you don't want to show favouritism. So he's like, well, I'll just make up my own. And that's exactly what he did. He just went, right. I'm going to make this the uniform that is worn at Windsor, um, called the Windsor Uniform, and just have eight of them made every year. Um, and he did. In his tailor's books, he has eight of them made every year. Um, and But do any of them survive? No. Not a single Windsor uniform from this period survives, which really helps when it comes to research. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, so, But what's interesting is that these depictions were how he wanted to be depicted as well, because it was also a simple uniform, but it was also showing military strength as well as fashion, because you had um, particular cuts that were fashionable, but also it's showing that, you know, even though he's roundabout, he's still wearing, you know, an official uniform. And then he also made it institutional for, um, for his sons to wear and other people in the royal court. And then also he put into production the fact that this was actually the first diplomatic uniform that we really had beyond embroidered court suits. We then went to, oh, uniform. So this was actually used at the Treaty of Vienna um, as the diplomatic uniform worn by the British. So um, we have uh, Wellington and the Prime Minister and various other members of the cabinet and whatnot wearing the Windsor uniform as the diplomatic uniform. Um, which is particularly interesting that we go from that to then the Victorian oak leaf sort of coming back into play um, as more of a diplomatic thing.
but that sort of staunch look of, right, we've just all gone through war, let's keep it a little bit plainer, because we've got to remember that they were going through massive recessions at this point in terms of high costs of living, um, food was incredibly scarce, so it didn't really pay to show off opulence. And this is a continuing trend, uh, especially through George III's reign, which is also why George IV, the Prince Regent, was very unpopular, because he was spending too much money on everything. But he would constantly wear this outfit. He, because for him, it's a simple, easy thing for him. It's very much like Einstein in the way in which he would have a wardrobe full of the same suits or Steve Jobs where it's all the same stuff. It's something he then doesn't have to think about. He doesn't have, then have to have the trappings of court. So in the same way as people nowadays will throw on jeans and t-shirt and not have to think about it, he threw on his Windsor uniform, knowing that he would look presentable and it would be absolutely fine and he didn't have to worry about, oh, it's for this particular regiment, oh, they've just changed this uniform regulation, I've got to change this button, that lapel, and all of this. <clears throat> um, he just went, boom, that's it. And it was so iconic of him. Now, he pretty much sticks to, you know, one main style of the Windsor uniform, which is this frack style. It just stays like this, it's much more open, it's much more quote-unquote Georgian. So, and I wanted to make something which would, because in the world of reenactment it's a bit tricky to sort of go along in a general's uniform or something, because you might put some people's nose out of joint if they've done reenactment for like 20-30 years or something, like, oh but you haven't done any of this, and it's like, oh it's just dress up, well, the good thing about the Windsor uniform, no one wears it, um, and the wonderful thing is that if you wear the Windsor uniform, you immediately outrank everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, automatic win, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. So, so it's quite a fun thing, and, and, and what's really fun is that reenacts and people, when I've gone to balls, they have no idea what this uniform is, and I'm like, huh, you don't know what the most important uniform is. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know anything. Um, so that was really fun to work out um, and sort of put together. So I wanted something that I could wear with a nod to things, but also because of one of my favourite portraits, which had lingered all over Pinterest and I'd seen pop up here and there, but could never find properly. This lovely, like, just, just, <laughs> it's a great look. <laughs> Prince Augustus Frederick George, the sixth son of George III, also the first Duke of Sussex. So I thought, oh, that ties in quite nicely with my love for the Royal Pavilion and the fact that he was at the Royal Pavilion a lot, probably wore this. Now this is when he's on his grand tour, hence Florence, um, and hence random neoclassical stuff. There he is wearing full winds uniform, thin order of the garter, <clears throat> order of the garter, star on the other side, but he's wearing it in a very different style to George III. Why? Well, it's 1798 and it's then in line with fashion. So it's like, okay, so the winds uniform can follow fashion. What does that mean for me wanting to then do something for 1811? <laughs> I can either do the young man's fashion or I can do the more statement-like Windsor uniform of George III, but that looks very Georgian. I wanted to find, where's the missing link? Carried on doing some research. Thank you, Royal Collection. We have a tailor's drawing. Oh. Oh, thank you, that was the right response. <laughs> oh. uh, very exciting, as well as then we have a um, guy whose name I cannot for the life of me remember, but in the Royal Collection, and it's that and it's that changing style slightly, where the angles are increasing, the fit is tighter, the, the way it's being put together is slightly different. Now, this one is 1808, and then this is 1812. So you think, okay, I've got a much better set of resources here. Um, and there is another one um, which, which gives more detail and stuff, but what's interesting is that there's then this angling going on, which was fashion in military fashion. So, it's then not a regulation, because it's not a really a uniform, but it's kind of a uniform, so they can't really decide, so it ends up being a thing of, well, what do you fancy? And then I look closer at an engraving of the, um, uh, of the Treaty of Vienna, and the cuffs for the Windsor uniform are all doing the pointy thing, and the pointy thing 
indicates that the fronts are doing an angled thing. That's just how they seem to go in Georgian uniforms or in military uniforms. So if it's flat, it means that everything's flat, which you see in George III, it's all flat, um, simple, no frills. But then with this, it's all sharp and angular and tight fitting um, and much more chic. As well as you see, the cut is different. So, so the cut for George III would have been a much wider Georgian back. And then you come to uh, the early 19th century, where all of a sudden you have this real tailored shaping of the back, which sort of brings it into a very, very different silhouette from the back. <clears throat> but interestingly, <clears throat> this one, you, you can tell because of the size, that, and it's that thing of, is it exaggerated to simply show how it's done, or is it exaggerated because this person was obviously larger and had more space to fill braid, which... <laughs> is actually something that's written about in Taylor's manuals when they're talking about dressing particular colonels or retired, you know, officers and things. And they're, they're still entitled to wear the uniform, but you'd need to account for a little more lace each and every time they're having something new made because the braid needs that little bit extra space to work around. So I always find that quite fun. Um, which, which is why those seem nice and long, rather than mine seem much smaller because there's less less to work with, as it were. But what I particularly found nice is that the cut changes from when you see George III, where it's much more enveloping and round, to then it being nice and tight behind the back of the leg. And that's once again, just fashion. So it's like, okay, they're wearing this often enough, but formal enough that it could work in regards to fashion. So then it came to, right, now I have my basis. Now I really wanted to work on this. And then, you know, I kind of had to at this point. Now, I also then had to work with um, finding the original sorts of materials they would have used, hence being casimir uh, and super fine wool, and luckily the most amazing. So I asked Hand and Lock, it's like, oh, hi, yeah, I need just half an inch braid, but like the metallic should be fine. They're like, oh, fine. And they sent me, they sent me the gold braid. I was like, <laughs> the, the, so, so it's two percent gold break, you know. So so this is like the proper stuff, which which you know I worked out for them just sending me the braid. It saved me like over a grand. Wow. So I was like, that's really helpful. Thanks. So that was great. Um, so then I thought, well, I've got to do it now. Um, you know, can't go back. Uh, so I decided to put it together because I wanted something special for organising my first event at the Royal Pavilion, which was a coronation thing. I did last May, and then in this May, I'm holding a ball, woohoo. Um, but luckily I've got the outfit sorted, so I don't have to worry about me. Um, and I wanted something other than a court uniform, because I have court uniforms, don't we all? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, just not another silk court cool. uniform. <laughs> e exactly, yeah, yeah. I'm from the beak. Exactly. So, 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 okay, fine, what do I do? So that's another reason that I went for the Winds uniform, and I was going for that very different look between the Windsor uniform that we know today as a blazer, the Windsor uniform which the late Duke of Wellington is actually painted in, standing in Windsor, which is lovely, and our other view of the Windsor uniform, which is George III. So I'm like, well, there were sons and dignitaries and people that were all the way in between, for which none of them survive, which really bugs me, because I think that it's a similar thing to the Order of the Garter, where it's the one the person dies, you've then got to give it all back to to the palace. Um, that's my working theory, but I've asked about it and people aren't even sure. So I'm thinking in the tops of people's attics or things, there's, there's uniforms like this around and about. So it's, you know, I just need to keep looking. Um, but, but the Royal Collection were like, no, we don't have any. It's like, why don't you have some? You're the Royal Collection, you should have some. Anyway, they don't, which was really helpful. Anyway, so another thing I did is that this sword is particularly special because <clears throat> Looking at the portrait of uh, Augustus Frederick George, you notice he's wearing a sword um, because, of course, a uniform like this has to have a sword with it. And I've got a sword, it's a silver cut steel court sword, which just wouldn't go and wouldn't be right with a uniform. You need an officer's sword, preferably like a gold fancy one. So a friend of mine's a military collector. And I asked him, hi, do you have like an English court sword? Doesn't matter if it's Victorian, like I, I, I just need a gold sword to wear. He was like, oh, right, yeah, no, no, I'll come around like, later this week. And he brought along just five swords that he just had. 
Um, one was a massive, oversized um, English Napoleonic cavalry sabre with all this amazing blue gilting and everything, and uh, it was stunning. Not appropriate for the uniform, but great to look at. Brought another court sword, and I was like, oh great, great, this would be great. And they said, oh yeah, but this one, this one you'll really like. It's got some royal provenance, and I'm like, really? So, he knew I was doing the wind's uniform, but that was it. Didn't tell him any of my research or anything that I'd done, because I just hadn't got around to that conversation. Anyway, that sword belonged to Augustus Frederick George. <laughs> the one who started off this whole journey. Um, and, and I've still got it at home, because he's like, I'll just hold on to it. And I was like, okay. Um, so, so that is actually his colonel sword when he was made colonel of the household cavalry. And it's, um, and it's a fire gilt sword and everything. So it wouldn't have been one specifically one with the Windsor uniform, but I'm like, it doesn't really matter at this point. But, because I'm like, that's really cool. And it's got its original sword nod on, and it's got the engraving of who, it, um, of, you know, to his majesty, da 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 um, And it's got the original sword nod as well, as it has the original um, catalogue number for the Hanover Armoury, <laughs> which is basically, you'd go in, and they have one at Windsor as well, which you'd assume, you know, King George III or, you know, even Prince Philip, you'd go in and there'd just be racks of swords and you'd be like, oh yes, yeah, you clip that one on, clip that one off. And it's got the original hand-stamped um, lettering and numbering system of just where it is in the inventory. I'm like, that's really quite cool. <laughs> so, so many buttonholes, so many buttonholes had to be done on this. Working with Casimir, trying to make it all work together and putting it all together. Now, I remember when I said French riding sleeve. I didn't think properly, and I found a better quality photo of the painting. We have a French riding sleeve. It's just a sleeve that buttons a bit more and goes up a bit more. And then I thought, wait, where have I seen that before? I've seen that on Nelson's undress uniform. So now I had a fuller understanding of, well, that's what a French riding sleeve is. It's basically a, a super tight sleeve which you wouldn't be able to get your um, hands down um, unless it had buttons. Because trust me, once you do these buttons up, you can't get your hands out. It, it sort of, and that makes sense for riding, so everything's not flapping about. It's a nice tighter fit. And so that from the research perspective was like, this is amazing, this is great. Because it was that niggling thing of, well, what is a French riding sleeve? Well, it's that, luckily. Now I found that out. But this was a really interesting journey, working through various collections, um, lots and lots of research and lots and lots of sewing, and working out sort of what are the nuances around a uniform that isn't a uniform, which kind of is sometimes a uniform, but with no thing actually written down about it, so much so which makes me think that a lot of things must have been more verbal or must have been a case of, oh, go to these tailors, they'll do it. And it's those little nuances and mysteries, um, which I don't think I'll ever quite get to the bottom of, which is kind of the joy of researching and something I don't think I'm ever going to quite, you know, get bored of yet. So, and then it all led me to then do my first event at the Royal Pavilion. Oh, hey. Woo! And then, here I am wearing it for you now. <laughs> but, um, yes, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much, Zach. Oh, um, have we any questions, anybody? Is it heavy? No, Is no. that metal, I mean? Well, I mean, it, it's it's because it's super thin. Right. You know, it... It's like a spun gold wire, and then it's wrapped around, well, originally it would have been on vellum and things like that, and now it's wrapped around on sort of like a cotton. Um, and, you, you know, it's all right, you know, it fits fine, and, and it doesn't feel heavy as such, mainly because it's only faced in a bit of cloth, and then there's no other lining in the coat at all, because the construction of these things is that there'd be 
a facing which would support everything. Um, but then from here around, you don't need anything. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you think if you're at a formal leve or something like that, that's another way in which you won't boil to death because you don't need all that extra layering. Um, so the only things really that aligned would be the sleeves and the facings at the front and just facing on the back. But then once you get to the middle of the back just here, it's just a single layer of wool, which is completely breathable. Thank mm. God. <laughs> yes, I, I did Google it um, before I came out, and I did see some pictures where um, Prince Harry and Prince Ooh. William were wearing... Uh, I think they just wear the black, dark black coat, don't they, and the mm. red trim. And I think there's an event where, uh, when Her Majesty was still alive, it might have been her 90th mm. or something like that. Mm. Event. But Prince Charles wasn't wearing the Windsor uniform. I wonder whether... Oh. Um, it's obviously not de rigueur, then. If they, if it... I, I, I think maybe you just didn't get the memo. I don't know. Um, so well, it's it's much more dressed down, does not it? It, it is much more dressed well, down one, wearing, and yeah. and now a version of it, in a way, is actually worn by the stewards and people that work at um, at Windsor. So the tour guides and things, they've got little, you know, outfits with red cuffs and collars and things, and that's kind of what it's turned into, which I think is, in a way, a little bit sad. But I I think it's sort of you know come alive a bit a bit. But it's interesting. I'd be interested to know whether that the people doing the guides and everything know the history mm. that links their modern polyester thing <laughs> to, you know, King George III basically getting a bit of a tizzy after losing the colonies and going, I want a uniform. Um, it'd be interesting to find that one out. I thought going along in your version to show them up a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, well that would be great. More people should wear this, as far as I'm concerned. More, more royals, you know, bring, bring... That's the thing with royalty. You know, you're there, you might as well put on a show. Um, you know, which is why I quite liked with the coronation. They changed it at the last minute to be like, yeah, wear your robe. It's like, yes, dance, monkey, dance. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we, we want to see the pageantry. That's the whole, well, that's it's not it, the whole thing. Really. Yeah, because when it really boils down to it, you know, there's, there's obviously tradition and all of that, but also what do we do better than anyone else in the world? Pageantry. And if they're not going to do it at a coronation, when are they going to do it? <laughs> so, so that was quite... Quite cool. Um, I, I kind of squealed when I saw that need to learn. I was like, yes! Because otherwise, I, I understand the whole paring down thing, but also in a modern world, if you want to pare it down, you might as well get rid of it. So don't pa pare it down, blow it up as a big thing, might as well. I mean, you know, the current political situation and everything is all a bit meh anyway, so anything to brighten up is quite nice. Any more questions? Yeah, Tim. Yeah. What does putting the uniform on involve? Is it time consuming? Not really, no. Um, it, it's, um, it's no really, there's no more difference to a three piece suit. Same, same components. Uh, the only thing that takes a little bit longer is the whole sort of fiddling with the knee breeches and things and putting on the garter, which is such a burden. Um, <laughs> you know, but. But it's those things of, um, once you build it into a routine and put it together, it's not really a problem. The, the thing that takes the longest for me, really, is doing the proper um, ironing and starching of the shirt and cravat. Just because you've got to starch it properly, uh, which is always a bit of a pain. Um, Do you use spray starch or anything? No, I use, a, I, I use a mixture. Yeah, I've created so a mix. No. no. So, okay, so what I do is I get like an old um, squeeze spray bottle. Mm. And put a bit of, um, well, actually, because I ran out of laundry starch, I've been using cornstarch, does the exact same thing. Um, but preferably you want, so, uh, uh, oh, during this period, they would have used a rice starch um, to be extra fancy. Um, and so, you know, you can just use a potato starch. Um, put some of that in with some water um, sort of do it as you're going to put it in a gravy, to be honest. Put it in the thing, add a bit more water, spray on, uh, put a tea towel on and just press. You know, that's all you need to do, and then you get a, and then you get a, you know, you get a proper stiff, stiff result, um, which is exactly what you need uh, because it keeps everything in place. And people think, oh, is it uncomfortable? No, because it's actually, it's not really touching me. It's kind of in its place, um, which is quite good. I mean, the cravat can take a, an annoying amount of 
fiddling about with sometimes. But in terms of getting it on and off, it's fine. You know, I suppose it's like other ceremonial uniforms and things like that, um, putting those on and off. But um, no, it, it's, it's not as arduous as you necessarily think it is. It's like a three-piece suit with a couple of extra steps. Yeah. From patterning up to actually making the, 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 the coat, so how long did that take you roughly? And it's all hand done. It? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it took me longer than I thought it would. <laughs> uh, so I was, <laughs> so I'd given myself time to do it. And then the Georgian exhibition happened at the palace and they wanted me to do things there and everything. So that was taking up time and I'm like, I should be sewing. Um, so it meant that I did this whole event having not slept the night before because I was finishing it off, <laughs> um, which is fine. We've all been there. Um, so ideally this uniform shouldn't have taken too long, but, but in terms of putting it together, I'd say a good solid month if I were to do it sort of a bit, a bit properly. Um, one of the hardest things is actually because the coat is made of super fine and the breeches and waistcoat are made of casimir. Casimir is a softer twill woven woolen, uh, which means that it won't take a cut edge um, and it will fray slightly. So it's treated in a particular way. Well, when you make it, you <coughs> prepare the seams and you do everything in a slightly different way than you would with a super fine. So this is actually a full cut edge rather than this is a bluff edge where it's folded, um, wrapped into itself, and then um, uh, and then sort of prick stitched along, along all the seams on absolutely everything. Um, and that, and then any corners then have to become mitered corners, which then you then have to press heavily with an iron, but not too hot iron because this, this burns very easily because it's such a soft, um, but it is so soft. It, 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 it's, it's called casimir because it's as close as wool will come to cashmere, effectively. It's so soft, it's wonderful to work with, and it naturally has a stretch to it. So it was always really used and worn for uh, britches. So it's got that sort of natural stretch. Um, and, and I made a, and, and just a testament to my skill, made a pair for my boyfriend um, for an event we went to in Italy last year. And, um, so people were drinking and this Italian woman decided in her full reading suggest to do the splits and Alex, not one to be shown up, um, then did a splits um, in his britches because he's a ballet dancer. He thought, easy peasy. And my first thought was, did my britches hold up? <laughs> <laughs> and they did. So I was like, great, excellent. The tailor's manuals make sense. So it's that thing of when you're recreating something, if you use the original crack materials suddenly, it all makes sense and it works in the right way and things perform in the right way. And the way I sort of get it across to people sometimes, especially to my dad when I first started doing it, he was going, oh, this wall's really expensive. Why don't you go for this? I found this one online, trying to be helpful. I was like, why don't you try this one? It's like, well, dad, if you're building a Formula One car, you're not gonna substitute carbon fiber for plastic, are you? And he was like, fair point. So it's like, yeah, you know, the, the right tools for the right job. And I think all of us sort of, being admirers of vintage and everything, it's the right weight of cloth, it's the right type of silk, you know, it's the right weight of things in order for it to hang and drape and form properly, which we want these things to do, which we love and enjoy so much. Um, so it's about sort of the devil's in the details, really. Um, and the wind's uniform, amazingly, because um, this is one thing that was really bugging me through my research purposes. I was thinking, for all other uniforms, there's something on the buttons. There's some emblem, there's some crest, there's something. Wind's uniform, there isn't any at all. And I found that really interesting, but it makes it really useful because it means that I can then use the bridge and waistcoat for anything else. So that's great. So it's versatile, really, when you think about it. <laughs> the casual wardrobe. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's, it, it's the little black dress of the 18th century. <laughs> Actually, it's a great topic for a talk, isn't it? <laughs> you know, Casimir small clothes, the little black dress of the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, Prince Regent and later George IV wear that? Yes, and, and he really hated the Windsor uniform <laughs> because he hated his father. Um, and he hated wearing the Windsor uniform because he liked the pageantry and everything. He thought it was too plain and too boring. Um, and 
he didn't like it because he felt like a soldier in a regiment because he was told you have to wear that, it has to be like that, and it was him and his brothers all dressed up. It's a bit like when you've got, you know, it's like the Von Trapps, but they don't enjoy themselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, pretty much, which pretty much describes George III's children, actually. It's like the Von Trapps, but they don't like anything. Um, but, but another interesting thing uh, is that there were... You know, and, and actually, interestingly, Augustus Frederick George is the only one of King George III's sons to be, um, well, is the most um, pictured in the Windsor uniform, which is interesting. So there's that portrait, there's another portrait, and then there's um, a portrait when he's younger, and then there's uh, two um, miniatures and things, and he's always wearing the Windsor uniform. So basically, he's a suck-up um, <laughs> to to his dad, but also he was quite sickly as a young boy because he had asthma and all of this. And so a really particularly interesting guy. Um, and he was a really controvert... So as the first Duke of Sussex, um, he was very controversial, a really interesting legacy, which the Sussexes have kept going. Um, and, and, I said that being controversial. Um, so he actually um, lobbied for um, Jewish emancipation and Jewish MPs, um, and he learnt Hebrew and everything. wasn't Jewish himself in any way, shape, or form, but really kind of like there's a whole subset of of the world that isn't being looked to. Uh, he campaigned for women's rights, and it's like this is the early 19th century, and we have a son of the king being really political. Um, so, so there were lo lots of correspondence between him and him and his dad going, stay out of politics, stay out of politics, he's going, why? And it's like, I'm the sixth son, what have I got to lose? <laughs> like, pretty much the tone. Um, so, but, but he was very much there for his, um, uh, for, for his later ailing and quite insane father. Um, but it's really, really interesting um, how often he's depicted in it. Uh, which is kind of what also drew me to the fact that, well, it's a uniform that he wore a lot. Um, but then George IV does start wearing the Windsor uniform in his own fashion. He starts wearing it um, when he becomes king as a double-breasted blue tailcoat, so same dark blue, no braiding of any kind, but then with red collar and cuffs. So it's that little nod of, oh yes, this is the Windsor uniform type thing, but my dad's dead, so I can do what I like now. Um, so it's that interesting thing of he just hated wearing it and he writes about hating to wear it because he wants to wear other military uniforms or fine court coats or more fashionable things because he thought it's looking really unfashionable now and just wanted to get rid of it. <clears throat> what Beau Brummel think? I don't know what Beau Brummel thought. No comment from him. No comment from him um, on anything, but also what's interesting is that everything written about Beau Brummel is either by Beau Brummel or his friends. <laughs> um, so I always take things written about Beau Brummel with a huge pinch of salt, because when you read anything outside of it, you think, that's made up. Like, that can't be true. So it's little myths and things. He was basically the first social media influencer, in a way. <laughs> well, because it's that whole thing of, Oh, how do you put on a show? Oh, these are his failed cravats. Bollocks. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, oh, I must have them laundered in the country. He's doing the Kim Kardashian thing of look at all this wealth and look at all of this and everything, but really he's complete fraud. Um, and was just mean to everyone. And part of the reason that he went for a very plain down wardrobe is because he couldn't afford what was fashionable because <laughs> he didn't have the money. So he was like, oh, well, let's do this. And then as he started to get money, he could then do the same thing with more expensive cloth and things like that and then it was seen as fashion. But that whole notion of where he invented the trouser and everything, people have been wearing trousers and all of that for so long, and people have been wearing them publicly and round and about, it's one of those sort of Savile Row myths mm -hmm. that end up becoming a thing. And now he's seen as this style guru, when really he probably in himself wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a bit depressing. Right. One more question, yeah. Yeah. Charles? I've actually got two, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> both practical and both quick. Uh, one, I guess, general interest. Um, do airport security guards flee as you yeah. approach the x-ray machine? Is this, uh, just, just one drink. Well... Uh, and, and sorry, and secondly, yeah. when you're doing the splits or the hornpipe, if you're accidentally accidental with your glass of port, I'm guessing normal dry cleaning, cleaning isn't going to quite work for you with all that braid. So Have you thought about the recovery stage? Well, 
So I wore this to the Napoleon premiere, and then I got invited back to the after party. Got to meet all the cast, got to meet Ridley Scott, and all of that, and got incredibly shit-faced with the free bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, biblically so, kicked out at like 5 a.m. along with Matt Smith. Um, and, and it was that thing of like, where am I? What the fuck is going on? Ended up staying at a friend's place, and it was that thing of like, you, you know, but that's nothing more Georgian. So it's that thing of, you should wear the clothes, the clothes shouldn't wear you. Live and work and move in them. Mm. The amount of original pieces I've looked at that have stains on, that have been patched. It's like, they're clothes, wear them, use them. So if I spilt port down here, I'd be like, oh! Um, but then you think, okay, practically, what can I do? Bung it in cold water. That's gonna get out most of it. If that doesn't lift it all out, then you go, okay, this then becomes second best. You know, um, but because I think red wine would probably just pull off this because it's, um, uh, so super fine wools uh, and things like this uh, are, are a form of broadcloth. They're shrunken down, so they're very dense and water just peels off them, uh, which, which is thankful, thank goodness. Um, and then your other question was about airport security. Airport security, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I obviously know I'm going to an airport, so you know, um, I, I, I don't wear boots, Wait, I wear sort of pumps and things. No, no, unfortunately not. But, but I did have the uniform and everything in my carry-on for when I was going to Venice, because um, I was wearing it that night. Um, and so, so it came on the scanner and I was like, we just seem to have a look in here. And I was like, well, it's an Napoleon reenactment thing. Da, 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 da. And they were like, oh, well, it's really cool. And they pulled these out. What are these? Oh, those are boot pulls. And that's what had come up on the thing. Because it's always the boot pulls, isn't it? Um, so, so that was fine. That was fun. But more often than not, they always want to search me just so they can ask questions. So like, where are you going? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? What are you dressing up for? You know, generally because they're curious. So I really haven't had any problems with airport security. Um, mainly they're just curious because it's just something out of the ordinary of people in, you know, loungewear and business suits, basically. You don't have a sword then? <laughs> no, no. So, so, so the sword hasn't left the country. I'm not going to, you know, and I could have worn it up here, but I'm like, I'm not doing that. So it's probably only going to be used and worn sort of around Brighton or where I can get places in a car, I'd say. But yeah, because it's very special. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh. Thank you.